In 1969, Swiss-born psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross led seminars to medical students on the topic of death and dying at the University of Chicago, seminars which arose from her experience with terminally ill patients. Twelve years later, in part catalyzed by her pioneering work entitled On Death and Dying, there are over 125,000 such courses and seminars offered yearly throughout the United States. In between her schedule of traveling a quarter million miles a year, lecturing, conducting workshops, and caring for terminally ill patients and their families, Dr. Ross is here with us today to discuss her work. I want to thank you for being here today, Elizabeth, and coming and donating your time to make this tape. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, the first question I want to ask you is one question which medical students and health professionals seem to have more than any other question, and that's, when is the best time and how is the best way to approach a patient with the information that they have a potentially terminal illness? It depends a great deal on what kind of illness. If you suspect somebody having multiple sclerosis, but you're not sure, you can wait a bit. You don't have to be in a hurry and tell them instantly. If you have a patient that comes to your office or you examine a patient and they appear to be full of cancer and you really need to act soon, you can't wait a year or two years, then you use a very different method about telling them. If you don't know the family, which happens in a large city hospital very often, ask the patient before you consider surgery, for example. I always tell my patients, we are trying to do surgery if we don't have good news or you're kind of person who would like to be told or would you rather we tell a family how, how does your family handle such problems and I sit with them and talk about it and I think one of the best ways I've ever seen it handled was at the University of Chicago Medical School where one of the surgeons was a very beautiful physician a real mm -hmm. you know the kind you would like to see everywhere he was a surgeon who had a lot of cancer patients, and when patients asked him, he said, well, they would ask him, how long do I have to live after the diagnosis was verified? And he would say, well, 60% have one year, 35% have two years, 4% have three years. And the smart patient would say, well, if I add that up, it's only 99%. What happens to the other 1%? And they said that 1% is for hope. And I think if you go in with this attitude, you will not have a problem. You can sit with a patient and ask them what they want to be done, how they want to handle it. And one of his patients told me, if it is malignant, I want you to be in the recovery room. And that means that it was malignant. And then don't talk to me because I'll be mad or angry or depressed or something. Just make sure that I'm awake and really register your presence. And then go out to the hallway and talk to my husband. When I'm ready to talk about it, I will call you. And I waited and waited in a recovery room. It was malignant. And finally she got angry at me and said, don't you remember our contract? Go and talk to my husband. <laughs> and I talked to him. And about three, four days later, she called me and said, now I'm ready to hear the truth. It always should be a dialogue not you deciding. At that patient. first meeting though, how do you get a feel for how much really to tell the patient? You mentioned giving them hope. How can you know how much the patient wants to know? Ask them. I don't know why physicians have a feeling that they're supposed to be mind readers. Some people look very tough and strong and they're like they can take everything and they can't take anything. It's a front. And other people look meek and have you know, you think they're very fragile and they're the ones who take it the best. You never know. Tell them gingerly and ask. Encourage your patients to ask questions. And from the way they ask questions, you know, you answer their questions honestly, always leaving a door open for hope. And then wait until they ask the next question. And how about the family? A patient? You see, it's not the problem in reality. If you don't have a problem. If for you it is not a nightmare, if for you it's not a fiasco or a failure or a trauma, 
the patients pick it up instantly how you feel about it. And depending how you feel about it, the dialogue will emerge. It, I think it is the biggest factor is how the person feels who has to give, quote, the bad news. <coughs> Most of your patients know before you know it, but they don't know it intellectually, they know it inside, they know it intuitively. So the best way to handle it, if you have a chance, is to talk to them about it before you know it. Because once you know it, then the whole thing changes. Whose responsibility, if any, is it to tell a family who is not aware that a patient has a terminal illness? Always the physician, but only with the permission of the patient. A patient, primary responsibility is the patient, not the family. And the physicians very often tell the family and not the patients, and that is terribly not right. That is a reflection of their own anxiety. And they use beautiful rationalizations. They say the patient would be depressed, or we tell them after the recovery, or all sorts of excuses, implying that it would be devastating and leading to more ill health, rather than to fighting it with the help of the physician. When you use the technique of the drawings, which I think you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. You can know ahead of time how much a patient knows. And then with the help of this drawing, with the patient's pre-conscious knowledge, you can read the picture and talk with him about it. Maybe it's we a, can get into the drawings a little. Yes, it would be a marvelous method. OK. Let's do that after I ask you a few more questions. I wanted to ask you if you can talk for a little while about the stages you have written about in On Death and Dying and whether patients go through all these stages. Uh, it seems that um, many people have the feeling that patients progress through, through these stages in order. Is that a misunderstanding? Yes, it's the understatement of the year. <laughs> when we wrote the first book on death and dying, it was to help hospital chaplains and you know young interns and residents and nurses to deal with some of the main behavior of their terminal ill patients especially patients who appeared to be in a stage of total denial and they had the urgent need that they really needed to talk about it because maybe they had small children at home or a wife who didn't have an income or a job and they didn't know how to handle it. They had many, many, many angry, nasty, horrible patients who would drive the nurses up the wall and ring every few minutes. And their anger was so intense, but nurses are always supposed to be sweet. And then I go out and let it out on the student nurses. And the student nurses go out and kick the dog or let it out on the husband or somebody always got it. And so we thought we were really helping the hospital staff to delineate certain stages of behavior that people go through when they go through any kind of crisis, not just dying. And it has been terribly misused. Now we see nurses open a door and the patient is angry. They don't even talk to the patient. They go to the chart and write, patient in a stage of anger. Has nothing to do with a stage of anger. Maybe the food is miserable, and you should talk to the mm -hmm. dietitian. Do, do you understand, understand the difference? What you're saying. Everything is now stages, and the poor patients get five more labels. That's not how it was. So meant. acceptance isn't uh, acceptance of death is not necessarily the goal. The goal oh, is no, the God particular. Forbid. To, for a patient to die with dignity is not to be pushed through because somebody said so from denial mm -hmm. to anger to bargaining to depression to acceptance in a nice neat order. To die with dignity means very basically that a human being should be allowed to die in character, to be true to themselves and be accepted with unconditional love, not me imposing my needs onto you. Maybe you have used all your life denial and for you, or let's use a patient who has been a, a Christian scientist, maybe uh, for them it's very difficult to get medical help. And many of them have problems like they hadn't prayed enough or they didn't have enough faith. A lot of people have this problem. For them to keep a stoical front and not to talk, for example, about the malignancy, uh, you do not do these people a favor if you tear their defenses down. How can you best help these 
Okay. Very simple. The very first thing you do is to check if it's not your denial. 90% of patients who were referred to me, quote, with a label, the patient is in a stage of denial, was not the patient's denial. It was the staff or the family. And you see a patient picks that up instantly. If you are uptight, if you change your rounds, if you smile artificially, or if you come in instantly a relative and says, oh, look at these beautiful flowers, or the nice weather outside, before you say hello, the patient knows you're only here to talk about nice things because you can't take the reality of this patient's life situation. Those people will maintain denial in your presence. If you're not using the now, you who comes to visit, mm -hmm. and the patient doesn't talk about it, remember that every human being picks their own people with whom they want to share their pain, and not just anybody who walks in. Nobody likes a hospital administrator to send in a counselor. You would pick your own friends, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. So what's so unusual? What I normally did when I was in a hospital, I would sit down and touch them and say, God, it must be difficult. And I look them straight in the eyes. And they look at you like they test you out. And I didn't run away and I didn't do it under the door. Mm -hmm. And they said, difficult, Dr. Ross, it's not even a word for it. And then it's like opening floodgates. You know, all the things that people play games. It's very painful. My saddest case happened two weeks ago in England. A woman called me up and cried on the phone and said her husband was admitted three weeks ago into the hospital. He was sick, but nobody expected him to be terribly sick. And the physician told her that he needed surgery, and he went through the surgery, and after he was recovering from the surgery, she was told by the treating physician that her husband would not live more than two weeks, that she should absolutely not tell him anything, that uh, he told him that he would be home in two weeks. That's this man's denial, not the patient's. And she was asked not to visit him outside the visiting hours because he would become suspicious. And then she said, you know, Dr. Ross, I've been married to this man for 43 years. It's very hard for me to wait out in the hallways and only come in for a few moments just so that he should not be suspicious. Don't you think there is a way that I could tell him? Do you understand that this is the doctor's problem, not the patient's? And I naturally encouraged her to go and be with him as much as humanly possible. You mentioned hope. What types of hopes do patients have that are different from physicians? In other words, uh, what types of hopes can patients have? At first, when they have not truly accepted the reality of their finiteness or their impending death. Almost every human being in our Western culture hope is associated with cure, treatment, or prolongation of life. You naturally share those hopes without giving them false hopes. Uh, when they have truly accepted the reality of their impending death, they say one day, Dr. Ross, I hope my children are going to make it. Or I hope God will accept me in his garden. It has something to do with God or life after death, or it has something to do what happens to the family after their death. But it clearly indicates help for other people or in another dimension. Then you know that they have accepted the reality of it. Hope does not mean always cure, treatment or so prolongation of life. That's a very different type of hope than the yes. physician may have at yes, that moment. But no human being can live without hope. And you have to understand that if you don't know, ask what is your hope. How so do you um, build upon the hopes of a patient <coughs> whose hopes may be unrealistic from a medical point Let's of view? Let's say a woman, every time I visit her, says, oh, Dr. Ross, I hope they come up with some research and a new drug and they will be cured by it. I would say to that, God, wouldn't that be wonderful? And it would be wonderful. I don't lie when I say that. But I say it in such a way that it implies it would take a miracle, but it would be wonderful. And one day I went to visit this woman, and she looked totally different. And I said, did you get a new drug? I mean, she looked like. <laughs> and she said, oh, no, Dr. Ross, 
I just know now that these drugs are not forthcoming and I'm no longer afraid. And then naturally I said, what is your hope now? And she's the one who said, I hope my children are going to make it. And then you do not say, oh, come on now, hang in there. I'm sure, you know, so many research laboratories work on that. That is your problem. Mm -hmm. If you really hear the patient, you would say, tell me all about your children. That mm -hmm. would help. So you have to tune in to where the patient is, not project your own needs. Right. And there's an acceptance that she has had of something yes. that was different from before. Very different. She even looked different. Really? She really looked like she had <laughs> to be drunk. Is that a acceptance of death, that, that phrase, acceptance of death, is that uh, different from the phrase will to live? In other words, can a patient who has a will to live also have an acceptance of death? Much more so. If a patient struggles, is bitter, resentful, has a lot of unfinished business, is fighting everything and everybody, that will drain a patient's energy like 90%. It drains them physically, emotionally, and in every way. If you can help them work through their old unfinished business, which does not have to do with death most of the time, but has to do, yes, I made a living, but I've never really lived. It's regrets, it's old unfinished business. I never took time out to do this and that. Is this all there is to life? Those are people who have existed but not really lived. Those have a terribly hard time to accept it. If you can <coughs> help them to work through uh, the energy that they have used to keep the lid on, all the unfinished business, and that have been drained by bitterness, resentment, displacing it, is all used and for their healing. So acceptance of death is not synonymous with resignation of life. It's the opposite. It's very different. It's the opposite. I'd say, I would say that those who have fully lived uh, have whatever physical energy they have left use for their physical body to live until they die. And at the end, they live, they become so creative. They write poetry, they start painting, when they can't work in the garden anymore, they start other hobbies. And they, they truly live. And you don't mm -hmm. see resignation and bitterness. Resignation and bitterness means that they have a lot of unfinished business. Those are difficult patients because chemotherapy, for example, works very poorly on those patients. You use the phrase unfinished business. Can you describe what unfinished that is? Unfinished business is the biggest problem. And if I could spend my whole life on one issue, it is to help people diagnose their unfinished business so they can be more whole, more healthy, and live fully. So no matter when they die, they look back and say, God, I have lived. That is really our work. Unfinished business can be a million things. Uh, it's not always negative things, uh, like you haven't talked to your mother-in-law for 10 years because she didn't approve of you marrying somebody that would be unfinished business and if she dies you feel a lot of guilt and you buy 10 times more flowers to put on her casket because you never talked to her for 10 years that's guilt and, and shame but uh, dying patients have an uh, incredible variety of unfinished business uh, I could give an example of a child uh, whose young physician wanted to put him on some experimental chemotherapy after he had been sick for six years out of his nine years. And I took one look at him and I knew that he was going to fight it. He just had it. He had accepted the reality of his death and he was no way going to participate. <clears throat> and I asked him and he said, no, thank you. And we took him home and I wanted to say goodbye to him. And he said, you come home with me. And I looked at the watch, symbolic nonverbal language, mm -hmm. and he said, don't worry, it only takes 10 minutes. And we drove into the driveway, and he told his father to take a bicycle off the hook that was hanging there for three years. His biggest dream of his life was to ride around the block once in his lifetime. He was never able to do it. And then he asked his father to put the training wheel on his bicycle. That takes a lot of courage for a nine-year-old to do that, and humility. Mm -hmm. 
And the father with tears in his eyes put the training wheels on. And then he looks at me and says, and you, Dr. Ross, are here to hold my mom back. Mm. You know, moms, I know. you want to go and hold them and run along and would cheat him out of his great victory. Mm. And I was holding mom back. We were waiting for us, eternity, until he came back beaming after he got on. He was barely able to stand. He was like a drunk man <coughs> and very frail and pale. Nobody would have thought that he was able to ride a bicycle. He came back, he was just beaming. Mm -hmm. And then he had his dad take the training wheels off. We carried it upstairs, and he says, no grown-ups, please. When my brother comes back from first grade, send him upstairs. Two weeks later, the doggy, the first grader, told us that his brother told him that he has to take his bicycle now, that it was the birthday present for his first great brother, that he would not be around on his birthday, and that he wants him to have the bicycle under one condition, that he never put the damn training wheels on. <laughs> That's a child's unfinished business. Maybe the most beautiful one is the poem from Vietnam. Is, is it okay if I Sure, read I'd like you to read that. I think that's for anybody who ever listens to this. <clears throat> it's every day unfinished business, uh, referring to sudden death. And who was this written by? <clears throat> it was written by a girl who had a boyfriend in uh, Vietnam. Remember the day I borrowed your brand new car and I dented it? I thought you'd kill me, but you didn't. And remember the time I dragged you to the beach and you said it would rain, and it did? I thought you'd say I told you so, but you didn't. And the time I flirted with all the guys to make you so jealous, and you were. I thought you'd leave me, but you didn't. And the time I spilled blueberry pies all over your brand new car rug, I thought you'd drop me for sure, but you didn't. And the time I forgot to tell you the dance was formal, and you showed up in blue jeans, I thought you'd smack me, but you didn't. And there were so many things I wanted to make up to you when you returned from Vietnam, but you didn't. Unfinished business in sudden death is much more of a problem. See, when you have somebody you diagnose with a terminal illness, it gives the patient and the family time to say, I love you, or I forgive you, or I was nasty with you. And finish a lot of old stuff. Uh, when somebody leaves and then you get the phone call, they're dead, <coughs> you have tremendous unfinished business, especially if parents scold the child and it goes to school and this gets killed in a car accident. How can health professionals help those families? The or most approach them even? What, how, in what ways can they approach them? The most important thing is that people would learn at the younger age how to live so they have grief when somebody dies and not grief work. If you have a little bit of time, you help families to take dying patients home to die, to have their favorite pet nearby, not to use extraordinary means to keep a body going when it is time to call it quits, uh, not to limit somebody five minutes every hour and then 55 minutes they have to walk up and down in the hallway when you expect that they live for a few more days, but it's very inhuman. When you have a, a great tragedy, you don't put people on volume and sedate them, because it cheats them out of dealing with the emotions. The most effective way of handling sudden deaths, um, and I'm dealing mainly with children now, mm. is when a child is brought in, can be suicide or an accident or, or whatever. Uh, we work frantically on that body. <clears throat> to keep the child alive. The parents wait outside in the waiting room. You have to be a parent once to appreciate what the nightmare this is. Nobody comes out and says, Oh, Mr. Smith and Mrs. Smith, I'm so glad you made it here on time. I will tell your child that you're here. We are working hard. You can't come in right now. But as soon as I have some news, I will come out again. If that child would die, five minutes later, those parents would never forget that nurse who cared enough to be a messenger to tell the child, even if he's in a coma, that mom and dad made it in time. Because the guilt, the fantasies they have, 
If only he had known that we were there, if we could have only held his hand. You know, all the Maybe normal... he didn't get good enough medical yes, help. Yes, just a million worries. And nobody thinks what the nightmare it is for parents not to know and sit. And they're not allowed to scream and they're supposed to be quiet. And they're not supposed to interrupt. And yet all they want is screaming to be there. It takes one nurse one minute to do that. How about after that, when after they get that, the news? If the child is dead, it should be, it has to be a physician to inform the family. And the reason we say that is in small communities where physicians are not always present. Many, many parents who have not been allowed to see the body, especially in, in sudden death, do much more poorly in the grief resolution if they have been informed by a non-physician. And they couldn't understand because some priests or some nurses or some social worker or some hospital personnel do a really beautiful job and sensitive and have more time than many physicians. And yet the result is not as good until we analyzed those parents after, later on, and found out that many of them had the feeling which had never verbalized that no physician was on the premises and if a doctor would have been there, maybe their child would have been saved. So I always tell people who are not physicians, mention Dr. So-and-so. Dr. So-and-so would have liked to tell you himself, but he was called away to the emergency, to the operating room or wherever. If a physician preferably informs a family, we never ever sedate the parents. Uh, mothers are sometimes in Valium for five years, I think that's mm. a crime. We have a screaming room. In every good hospital should have a screaming room, which is a small cubby hole soundproof, costs about $55 to install it. And we staff the screaming room with members of the compassionate friends. Those are parents who were in the same spot, in the same life situation, two years, five years before. We have helped them, and they've been trained not by textbooks, by life. And they know where you're at in a moment like this. The whole world collapses. And they take those people in that screaming room, and very much depending on the personality, some are numb. Many of them are just totally numb. Don't push them, just be there. Be a shoulder to lean on, which they don't touch usually when they're numb and in state of shock, but at least it's there. Some people are very busy, they want to call everybody to, to arrange things. Other people scream, quote hysterical, which is the healthiest way to express it. Um, you have a pot of coffee or tea or water in there. We have a telephone book, we have a piece of, of a hose that they can just shred the telephone book to pieces mm -hmm. to externalize their, their rage, their anger, their anguish, their guilt, whatever comes out. And then when they have externalized their imminent feelings, instead of being sedated, externalized it, we always, always ask them to view the body. It's terribly important in a sudden death. Those who have never been allowed to view a body in a sudden death, especially if you have no body like in drowning or in plane crashes, have a much, much longer grief period, sometimes five years, ten years. They're still in a partial denial. Those who have been allowed to view and touch the body and identify the body, even if it's mutilated, you can bandage the head if necessary or whatever. A mother and a father always recognizes <clears throat> a hand or an arm. Uh, it's emotional, but they're allowed to express their emotion and not... What happens <clears throat> to that unexpressed emotion if they can't express it? If they can't express it, it's repressed. It leads ultimately to ill health, physical and emotional ill health. And sooner or later, those people need professional help, which can be totally prevented if it is handled mm -hmm. immediately. The hardest time in sudden death is four weeks afterwards. See, the first few days you're numb, you're mechanical, you're like a robot. Then after the funeral, all the relatives go home, the neighbors have stopped cooking, the pastors have stopped visiting. Life, quote, goes on as usual. And then it hits you. It's like mm -hmm. the numbness wears off, and then, oh my God, Susie's really never coming back anymore. And then the couples are usually at the phase 
one is just coming out of the denial. The other one may be already in a depression and expressed over rage and anger. And this is the reason why 65% of all the couples are in the process of separation and divorce after the death of a child. It seems that at this stage there's a tendency for the people to maybe feel abandoned. How can they not feel abandoned? What can you do to if still maintain contact? If you're a real them? friend, you don't come immediately. You come immediately for some acute help. Like one mother whose husband and three children were killed out of state, had three children at home, the little ones. She was supposed to fly to the place where they wanted to visit grandpa. She was notified that her husband and her three children were killed. She was in a total state of shock and numbness. And the total stranger, she thought, came next to her bachelor that she had never talked to and said, I'm coming in to clean all your shoes to get them ready for the funeral. And took all the family shoes of all these children full of mud and everything, waxed the shoes, lined them up and said, if there's anything else practical I can do, I live next door. A year later, all she remembers of this nightmarish day is that the neighbor came to clean her shoes so they had clean shoes to go on the plane to go to the funeral. That is help, not sweet language or God wanted your children or all this stuff that only enrages people. But be practical. You know, when you're in a state of shock, you can't think straight. So you clean shoes, you cook a dinner, you help with the children, whatever. The real help, that is real help, yeah. but the help afterwards for the grief resolution should preferably come about four weeks later when they're deserted. If you just call or drop by and say, is there anything in the world I can do for you? This must be the beginning of the lonely time. And say it. And they will understand that you have compassion. And if they have something, they will tell you. And if not, say, is it all right if I come back and ask again in a week? When's an appropriate time to share with a family who you don't personally know but knew the individual who died thoughts and positive memories about how their son or daughter influenced your life in a positive way. How, how can you go about sharing some of those feelings? I think the best way is when you feel it, because it comes from here and not from mm -hmm. here. If you write to them, many parents of many of my thousands of teenagers who die, I, I don't know, you know how much our suicide rate goes up. It's very tragic death. And if somebody writes to them and says that your child had meaning, touched many lives, and write them a letter of how they touched your life, it sometimes keeps their sanity just to read those letters in the weeks that follow the death of a young child. It keeps them busy, make a scrapbook, read them over and over again. And in the first few weeks after a tragic or unexpected death, sometimes the only thing that keeps people together. Again, with the emphasis, if you don't sedate them. And if you do sedate them, then you just put you them are responsible for all the consequences of that tragedy, because the brothers and sisters have no more mom, the husband has no wife, and they just function like robots. And it has so many negative repercussions all around. It is tragic. People should see once what they do when they make such a prescription. How can someone who's uncomfortable, someone who's in the medical profession, who's uncomfortable with the process of, of death and dying, go about becoming less uncomfortable? Be honest and humble. Humble to acknowledge that we're all human beings, that we are all created this way by our upbringing. Children are not born full of fears and hang-ups. They were given to us. And if we can understand that there are many simple means and ways to diagnose your own unfinished business and get rid of it so you become a full human being. One of them is what we're doing in our five-day workshops. We help people to look at themselves and only look at what you react to. Since no human being can take on another person's pain or grief, look what kind of people make you mad more than 15 seconds, make you cry, make you try to want to walk away. What patients do you wait twice as long before you go in because there's something about 
the patient or that illness or the process of his illness that makes you uncomfortable. Ask yourself what happens when you want to ask to help patients and talk to them about death and dying. And they tell you to scram four, five, six times in one day. You begin to wonder why am I not a good physician? You know, don't I use the right language? Do you feel inadequate, helpless, hopeless? Mm -hmm. That's a diagnosis of your own answer. So the goal is to be honest. How about if that honesty involves telling them, I feel fearful, angry? Yeah, you can admit it to a certain point, but I think it would be much safer and, and healthier in a way if you would go to a safe place and externalize your own pool of repressed grief and unfinished business. It is always correct to share but you have to do it tactfully and, and also know the limits. To me, it's like medication. The right amount at the right time is a blessing. Too much and too little is a curse. Sure. It's many times I felt very uncomfortable, didn't know what to say. I said, you know, something about the sitting here makes me uncomfortable. I don't know what to say. Can you help me out? And then they said, you know, your problem is do we need to talk? Can you just sit with me? That's really all I need. Mm. And I said, wonderful. And then I thank you later for having been frank enough to say something sure. stiff about right. us. Or oh, one patient, I make <laughs> all my patients as in-house calls. And I was brought up in a, you know, upbringing. Doctors are always sweet, doctors are always nice, doctors never say no. And I lived up to this expectation. So I told this woman, make a house call when the clinic is finished and I drive by her house. And that day I just wanted to go home, be a housewife, be with my children, cook dinner and not have to make house calls, which was in my own spare time. And, you know, good people don't do that, quote, unquote. Right. So, crouchy, I went to her house, she kept the door open this much, so I walked in and I smiled, which I'm supposed to do, I thought in those days, <laughs> She took one look at me and says, Dr. Ross, you don't want to be here today. And you know, I was this close to saying, oh, I love to come visit you. <laughs> and she took one look at me and said, no, I don't know why, but all I want to go home is to my children and cook dinner. And she said, do me a favor, hop in your car, go home, be with your children, because there are days I don't want a house call. And I think you've come so far out of your way. I have to be nice. So we make a mutual agreement when it's not comfortable, we just say so. Sounds and good. And I went home and had a wonderful evening. And a few weeks later, after an enema, I came to visit her and she didn't <laughs> want to see me. And she said, remember, you went home cooking. Well, if I could get up, I would want to go cooking now. Sounds That's good. the honesty. Yeah. It's lovely when you have this relationship. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be phony baloney, and you don't always have to be sweet and nice. And if you're a grouch, say to them, I'm a grouch, but it has nothing to do with you. It makes you more human. Mm -hmm. You want to use the blackboard. I forgot what you were going to use it for. Do you I remember? I wanted to show how you can uh, understand oh, how to become more whole. Okay, sure. And that also has to do with the care of dying patients. When you visualize that human beings uh, consist of four quadrants, you're a physical human being for the first year of life. And in this period of time, you need all the physical loving, touching, holding, hugging that you can get. And the same thing is true of dying patients. The first primary care of dying patients is physical. Never send a pastor or a counselor in if they're not physically comfortable. That means pay free, pain free, keep them conscious if humanly possible, not so sedated that they can't communicate anymore dry and all those things and then you take care of the emotional quadrant with children the emotional quadrant develops between age one and six it's where we get all our basic attitudes that ruin us for life <laughs> that's all the shoulds they're very artificial if we would raise our children again with unconditional love and firm consistent discipline with natural emotion not all the unnatural stuff that we were raised with you would then develop an intellectual quadrant at age six and be very excited, it would be a challenge to learn and go to school. 
then you develop your spiritual quadrant, or intuitive quadrant, when you're a teenager. And it is from this quadrant that you communicate with patients on a pre-conscious level, especially if they're young children. When your physical quadrant deteriorates before you're an adolescent, the intuitive quadrant emerges prematurely. This is why young children before they're adolescents who die, they are five, six, seven-year-old children, even their intellectual quadrant does not understand what the brain tumor is or cancer. They know what they have, and they know they are dying long before the adults. And a good counselor or a good pediatrician uh, knows that and communicates with that quadrant, with the dying children. The natural emotion, I don't know if we have time for that, mm -hmm. uh, is you have only two natural fears, and that is falling and loud noises. And we naturally have lots of unnatural fears and phobias, like the fear of what your neighbors think about, and all the phobias and anxieties that you deal with in everyday practice. Grief is a natural emotion. It helps you deal with a thousand little deaths from losing your security blanket to your favorite tree dies in the winter, losing your vision. This is why people who have a retarded child or lose a tree or they lose their vision or get amputated or lose a breast go through the stages of dying. This is the little deaths. Some people go through the stages of dying if they only lose their contact lenses. You understand that? The size of the loss is irrelevant. Uh, if you do not allow children to express their grief or uh, parents to grieve when a child dies and pat them on the back and say it's not so bad when you're dying, well, it's pretty bad when you're 18 years old, uh, then if they're not allowed to express grief, they become bundles of self-pity. <coughs> Anger is a natural emotion. It takes 15 seconds for a child to say, no, thank you, no, mom. And if they're allowed to do that, they express self-worth and inner authority later on. If not, they become bundles of rage and hate and revenge, and that's naturally the problems that we have in our society all over the world now. Jealousy is a natural emotion. Uh, young children want to learn how to ice skate, how to use a kayak, how to play a flute, how to read a book, and if it's belittled or ridiculed, it turns into envy and competition. And love is the biggest problem. The love that has two components, one of them is love that holds and touches like the, the baby, and the other is the ability to say no like the mother who would not hold on to, to Jeffy's bicycle, to give him that victory that once in his life, a week before he died, he was able to fill his dream to ride around the bicycle. If physicians would practice unconditional love as part of serving mankind as physicians, they would ask patients when they have made a diagnosis, they would tell them the prognosis approximately with always leaving 1% hope, they would say, from my intellectual knowledge, I would recommend chemotherapy or surgery or radiation or whatnot. I will bring this up one more time next week. Think about it, investigate, ask questions, but you have one week to make up a decision. <coughs> the second time they would say, have you thought about it? Do you have any questions? And they would say, yes, I've asked several patients with the same kind of treatment. I don't want to be nauseated. I don't want to throw up. I don't want to lose my hair. Maybe there should be other methods. You would give them all the side effects, mm -hmm. honestly, and the good aspects of it. And then you would say, I will ask you one more time. And if you say no, the only thing you have to remember is that they will always care for you, implying even if you do not gratify my needs. Mm -hmm. That is practicing unconditional love. And you never ask a patient more than three times. 
you know how we use the children's drawings now to help us to find out what treatment helps mm -hmm. patients. Maybe you can we, mention a little yeah. about that. We use the intuitive quadrant of children by asking them to draw a picture mm -hmm. so that we know that they are aware of their impending death or whatever unfinished business they have. Because we've been doing that 10,000 times with children of all ages up to 99 year old, mm -hmm. grown ups naturally too. Uh, if a four or five year old child knows preconsciously about the brain tumor and it's in their drawing, they obviously can't know it intellectually, then grown ups must have this too. And only because of their unfinished business, which is all this, they have repressed their intuitive quadrant. If you are a very tuned in physician and have very little unfinished business yourself, and you're humble enough. You ask the patient, for example, to draw your picture before you start treatment after a diagnosis of a malignancy, for example, is confirmed. And my masterpiece mm -hmm. is that man who was an architect who was asked to draw a picture after the diagnosis of a malignancy is made, and he was asked to conceive of his cancer. And he drew a man with the head and arms and legs. I'm only drawing a pot belly now. Mm -hmm. And he drew a whole body full of red concentric circles, which were huge cancer cells, which almost took up the whole body. That's how he visualized this cancer. And then he was asked to conceive of chemotherapy, which was very, very indicated from our intellectual quadrant. And this man, using this quadrant, drew black arrows like this, and every arrow deflected away from the cancer cell. Now, something didn't compute because normally the chemotherapy would really destroy the cancer cells. So if I would see this patient, and the oncologist referred him, and I see this picture, I would say to him, what did your doctor tell you about the chemotherapy? And this man says, my doctor told me the chemotherapy kills my cancer cell. And I said, yes projecting my needs and his face dropped and I said what did your doctor tell you like I'm missing something mm -hmm. and he said my doctor told me chemotherapy kills my cancer cell and I look at this and said yes but meaning there is a but to it and he looked very seriously and said thou shalt not kill and I said huh implying not even your cancer cells. And he said, no, you understand, I'm a Quaker. I really don't believe in killing. If I can practice unconditional love, that means serving your needs, not my needs. I would say to this man, I think that's wonderful. I hope there would be more people who can live up to the universal laws like this. But I have needs too. I'm a physician. I want to get you well. Go home and conceive how to get rid of your cancer. And this man goes home and a week later he comes back. He has his week to contemplate, to think about it. And he comes and has to draw me a picture. And his picture this time does not have the red cancer cell but has these adorable little gnomes looks pregnant. Hmm. You call them gnomes, right? That's right. They're little like dwarfs. Right. The whole belly was full of them, each one lovingly carrying a cancer cell away. The moment I saw this, the same man with the same cancer, with the same physician, with the same chemotherapy, was put on chemotherapy the same day and he's well today. That, to me, is practicing holistic medicine. That means dealing with the physical, emotional, intellectual, and intuitive quadrant. And you can only do this, not only, but you can do that easy when yourself you're open and understand that human mm -hmm. beings consist of all four. And with your own humility, 
you acknowledge on some level that your patients know more than you do. Not intellectually, you understand, but on an intuitive mm -hmm. level. And if we can work together, it is a mutual benefit. This physician's surgery has, I think, gone down about 50%. Mm -hmm. And the success rate is just overwhelming. And we are having more and more physicians now using methods like this. Mm -hmm. In combination, not excluding, you understand, chemotherapy or radiation, but use it as an adjunct. To, to use all parts of the human mm -hmm. being and becoming a uh, helper and help be, can you mm -hmm. say that? Yes. You're both teachers and students. Because everything I learned, I learned from my patients. Mm -hmm. and, and in exchange, I can help them. And that's really what medicine should be all about. And it's very beautiful and I love it. <laughs> patients in these situations are often uh, bombarded by well-meaning friends with a variety of orthodox and unorthodox treatments and methods. Uh, how can the physician help the patient at this time when they're getting this massive information from all it's different angles? It's only a problem right now. I'm in about 20 years from now, it's not the problem anymore. We had a workshop in Holland, and a, a young man was there who just drove us all up the wall. And he kept saying, I have no problems. And finally, I said, you really get them out, because you're driving everybody up the wall. That's a good indication that you have problems. And they said, no, I don't have a problem. My mother has the problem. But I said, you are in a workshop, not your mother. What's the problem with your mother? Well, the mother was a 70-plus-year-old, very typical European woman, who all her life listened to her father, then to her husband, and when the husband died, to her <coughs> doctor. And she never expressed her own opinion. And when she was diagnosed as having cancer, the doctor told her, we are going to the hospital, we are going to have surgery, we are doing this. She never questioned it. Fortunately or unfortunately, she had a son who, if he was in the United States, I would call him a Californian. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Sure do. A little right. esoteric, to put it yep. politely. But he threw everything out from the old and only believed in the new, which is always radical and not appropriate. And he insisted that his mother does not go to hospital, does not have surgery, she has to fly to England to see Hilo. And the mother's problem was not that she was dying of cancer. The mother's problem is, whose needs do I gratify? My old doctor, who has been like a substitute father figure for her since she was a widow, or my son, who in the meantime has become a man and also started pushing her around. And they said, why don't we call mom up and ask her? And they said, my mother never expressed her own opinion. I said, I bet you she's gonna express it if she doesn't know that she's expressing it. Ask her to draw three pictures. And we gave her the instructions over the phone. She sent us the pictures. We put it up on the wall. And in the workshop were 11 physicians, unanimous vote what mom wanted. What was not, the verdict? Not uh, from the intellectual mm -hmm. quadrant, but from her intuitive quadrant. This was a year and four months ago, and she's still doing well. But the verdict, this is not important, but you have a way as a physician mm -hmm. to find out what mom really wants when she does not try to please other people. See, love is our problem in our society. I think almost everybody has never experienced unconditional love. I love you if you bring good grades home. I love you if you make it through high school. God, would I, would I love you if I can say my son the doctor. And so you raise a generation of people who prostitute themselves for love. They, they think they can buy love with good behaviors, degrees, nice smiles, nice dresses, all sorts of a form of prostitution, and that is the big problem. If you do not have claims on other people or expectations, but help the person to bloom their own flowers, mm -hmm. then you don't have these problems anymore. And I think our next generation is going to experience that by, can you say, by default? Mm -hmm. Because 30% of many population groups children commit suicide. 
almost all of them, because they love you, if. Mm -hmm. We cannot afford to lose a third of our children by suicide. It seems a big ingredient to this is to be a better listener, and that's my last question. How can we be better listeners? You cannot listen to others if you can't listen to yourself. You cannot love others if you don't love yourself. If you have never experienced unconditional love, you want so much to please that you impose your desperate needs to please others and you never live. If you want, if your inner voice, you listen to yourself, if you wanted to be a singer and your father wants you to be a bookkeeper, risk your life but become a singer. Then you hear other people need to be a singer or whatever. You, you have to practice it with yourself before you can help others. And if you have a good friend, tell them, if I don't hear you, step on my toes, mm -hmm. you know, to, to make you aware of what you're doing. Not to others, but yourself. Mm -hmm. Because you have to start with yourself before you help others. And, and then the world. Mm -hmm. You have the most beautiful profession in the whole wide world. Use it as a gift, not an obligation. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. being here. I think you've shown us all the tools we have to not only help patients, but ourselves as well. And what little time we have. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Thank you. Raised in the comfortable surroundings of an upper-middle-class Swiss home, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross left at the age of 16 to fulfill a childhood vow to help those in need in post-war Europe. For more than four decades, psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has devoted her life to helping others in need, a direction which eventually led her to the care of terminally ill patients. Through her pioneering work entitled On Death and Dying, she has focused international attention on how to best help dying patients live life as fully as possible. Thank you for being here today, Elizabeth, and coming to make this tape, donating it for us students. You were one of three triplets born in Switzerland. You left home at the age of 16, making your way across post-war Europe, setting up typhoid stations. Can you share with us a little of where your work and interest in death and dying began? You know, you only understand decades later why certain things were significant in your life. You don't know this when it happens. Like people who lose all their children within a year of cancer. They think it's the end of the world. And then you meet them 10 years later and you see all the things that evolved out of this tragedy. And that's how I look at my life now. I was born a two pound shrink. Uh, 55 years ago when two pound babies were not expected to live. I was a dreadful disappointment to my parents. My mother was very big and expected a big gorgeous baby girl. And then I came, looked like nothing. And then 15 minutes later another sister came. She was like an ex my excuse, you know, for me being so tiny. And uh, my mother kept saying there is more to come. And the doctor and my father told my mother she had problems. Okay. And she didn't have problems. Half an hour later, a six and a half pound baby was born. And I was raised with all these stories. So I learned very early in life that grown-ups, when they don't want to face something, they use denial. 
that was my first lesson in my life. My second lesson in my life, and seeing that I don't believe in coincidences, I believe that this is all a purpose. My second lesson in my life was that grown-ups are terribly not honest. Uh, my father nor my mother knew who is who. So if they didn't want to admit that they didn't know their own children, they always gave my sister and me a combination name. And each time they used a the combination name, we knew that they didn't know. Do, do you understand? Exactly. You grow up this way, you know. Then teachers, we thought they, they are going to be honest. They will know who is good and who is bad in a subject. So we made it a real point to be miserably bad, I mean outstandingly bad, or outstandingly good in a subject. Came the time for the great cards, we both had straight C's. Because the teacher wanted to be fair and didn't know who is who, so we got average grades. So we learned it doesn't pay to be very good or very bad. The implication was nobody cares. And so I grew up with being very famous. We had big billboards when we went to school. And because you were a triplet. Yeah, and, my, and we were dressed like dolls. And in those days, see, triplets, that wasn't long before the pill. So people didn't have multiple births. It was very rare. And for them to survive was even more rare. So we were photographed all the time. And we had loving parents. We had a gorgeous house. We had everything, but we had absolutely nothing. I cannot remember anybody who knew that I was me. We were the famous triplets. And it's terrible to grow up without uh, individual identity. And I think that was the biggest gift in my life, because later I worked with people who had everything but had no identity. I worked with multiple handicapped, retarded, and blind children. They were referred to as the hydrocephalus in the room so and so. Then I worked with chronic hopeless schizophrenics, was the paranoid schizophrenic, the hyperphrenic, and they all had nice labels, but nobody knew who was behind the medical diagnosis. And then naturally dying patients, it was the pancreas C8 in room 15, but nobody knew that they had children at home and, you know, who worries about paying the bill or whatever. And I think that was an incredible gift. Uh, my my uh, awareness of the problem, I had no awareness that I had no individual identity naturally. In those days, people didn't go to psychiatrists, thank God. When my sister was a teenager, a young teenager, she fell in love. And that was kind of shocking to me because we shared everything. We had the same clothes, the same shoes, the same bedspreads, the same gray cars, the same everything. And suddenly my sister was in love. And it was like strange. And the second time her boyfriend invited her for a date, my sister became very sick. And she was heartbroken like any teenager would be because she was terribly afraid she would lose him. And I said in character, I said, listen, if you're that heartbroken, I'll go for you. He will never know the difference. And naturally, my biggest, fondest wish was that somebody would know the difference. And I asked her how far she went. And I went on a date for her and came home and I knew that he didn't know that he went out with his sister. And I think I needed that shocking experience to be aware of, you know, how far can this go? This is terrible. And then my father was a very authoritarian Swiss. You know, he told you what to order in a restaurant, what to eat, when to come home. Everything was his control. And he also decided that I had to join his business. And I'm not the businesswoman. I would have been an unhappy, miserable grouch for the rest of my life probably very rich and successful, but unhappy. And I said, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. Natural anger. My father did not take no, thank you. Um, so I left home. And that was very hard also, but the blessing, because in the process of finding out who I am as a human being, as an individual, I was able to do all these fabulous things after the war, which you can only do in a post-war period where you can hitchhike with the equivalent of two dollars in your pocket, went all the way to Russia and back, slept behind cemetery walls. I wasn't afraid of anything. That was one great asset I had. And I knew that people were afraid of cemeteries, especially at midnight. And it was the only safe place for a young girl to sleep. I was wrapped in a blanket and 
slept there. And that's where I learned my biggest lesson, is that under certain circumstances in life, all of us can be Hitlers and very destructive, even if you think you're a Pestalozzi or a Mother Teresa. Uh, at one time, for three days, I had no food in my stomach, and I was starved. And suddenly the thought occurred to me, if a little girl would walk by me with a piece of bread in her hand, I would steal a piece of bread out of that girl's hand. And I love children. And I think when you have experienced that, you would never condemn a man and send him to prison because he steals when he's hungry. Do you understand that mm. it, it enhances your compassion and your understanding that's very different from reading a book. You have to live it. Uh, when I came to Maidanek, to the concentration camp, it's different reading a book like Anne Frank. You can cry for a moment and, you know, empathize, but to stand in front of a concentration camp and see trainloads of baby shoes of murdered children, 960,000 children were put in gas chambers and murdered and starved to death. Uh, and you look at these trainloads of baby shoes of the victims, and you look at carloads of women's hair that was removed to send back to make cloth for winter coats out of it. And I think that my interest was not death and dying. My interest was what kind of man and woman can put thousands of children in gas chambers. And they worry at the same time if their child at home has chicken pox. It's so uh, incongruent. And I went into the wooden barracks to see if the children left a message. I wanted to know how they walked into death knowing that it's coming. And nothing they can do about it. And I saw messages to mummies and daddies, but the most frequent symbol was butterflies scratched into the wooden barrack walls. And I needed to know what those children knew that I didn't know. And they were little guys, you know, five, six, seven-year-olds. And then a young Jewish girl watched me, and we started to talk. And she said, you would be capable of doing things like this. I said, oh, no, not me. And she said, oh, yes, you. Because I watched my grandparents, my parents, my brothers and sisters walk into the guest chamber. And I was spared because there wasn't room for another one. And I swore I'm going to spend the rest of my life telling everybody about the atrocities of Nazi Germany. And when they came to liberate the camp, I looked at those young men, and I said, oh my God, I almost did it. Because if I would actually do that, I would not be any better than Hitler himself. Because all I would do is to plant seeds of hate. And for that, I survived, she said. And she said, so you see, all of us have the free choice to acknowledge the negativity in us and get rid of it. And then we can all become, I use the sim symbol now of Mother Teresa, if you understand that. And to become unconditionally loving, which I think is the ultimate goal if we will have a better world, is to be honest enough to acknowledge our Hitler in us. And if you have a safe place where you can share that, where you can externalize that and let go of it, then you automatically become a more compassionate, mm -hmm. more loving person. How does one go about letting go of that? There are many ways. It's, it's something we teach in our five-day workshops, and we don't teach it. I'm only a catalyst. We invite mm -hmm. 75 people. The youngest was an 11-year-old dying girl, and the oldest was a 100 years and three months mm -hmm. old lady. And one-third of dying patients or parents whose children have been murdered who have a lot of rage and hate to its the assailant, mm -hmm. the murderer, or uh, parents of children who commit suicide, which is the third cause of death among our children now in the United States between age 6 and 16. Uh, one third are doctors, nurses, clergy, uh, counselors, and one third are regular people. And they're know. here for a five-day workshop. They're here for five days, and then the first day we ask them why they think they're here. We're using the intellectual quadrant. 
And they all come with that nice stuff. I'm here to be a better doctor, a better nurse, a better son. -so. And then have shared the most superficial layer of their awareness. Then we tell them why they're really there. And we use the drawings. And they are shocked and amazed and awed and, and surprised. And then on the next day, it's almost always a patient or a quadriplegic or, for example, the mother who lost all her children of cancer within six months. Somebody's in a lot of pain who shares their anguish, their rage, their pain, anger at God, uh, whatever. And a half a dozen people start crying. And the one who shares of themselves, which is a gift, touches your pool of your unfinished business. Because you can only cry your own tears, you understand? Mm -hmm. Even if you say, I'm crying for her, baloney, you cry your own tears. And so for two days, 75 people push your buttons and literally help you to open up your own unfinished business. And you externalize and share that. And it's a very moving experience. 82% of the participants have a positive permanent life change. And you cannot do it with smaller groups. It doesn't work so well. I'm getting in touch with my own Hitler uh, every day of my life. If I get negative or angry more than 15 seconds, or depressed, or I drown myself in my old self, pity, poor me, or whatever, I try to be aware of it. And then when I have a quiet moment in a motel room or wherever, I try to get rid of it so that I can become more loving also towards me. Mm -hmm. You know, not judge me, but try to understand where it comes from. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the unshed tears that the participants have a chance to shed. What happens in a person when they can't shed those tears? What happens to the unshed tears? Like you go into a patient's room and it's a young mother who has five little children at home and you have a heck of a time not, not just sobbing or crying. When you look at this young woman, you know, who's dying and she has all these children at home, that means that there is some old grief in you. Because if you had not unshed tears of your own life, you would have great love and compassion for that mother and could help her without being overwhelmed with your own grief. You cannot let it come out right there and then. Some student nurses, you know, cry with every patient, but that's at the beginning of their training. But they do need that, you know, the screaming room I mentioned mm -hmm. for parents whose children have been killed and have just been told about it. The staff needs the screaming room very badly because if you have a screaming room for the staff too, they can then go into that room and just sob and cry and get in touch with all the repressed memory brings, this brings up. And then they can be nice and, and functioning again. Or if a patient makes you feel like you're really going to strangle that guy if he calls you one more time. Well, you can't go around strangling your patients. But you can go in the screaming room in your break time and beat a rubber hose on a telephone book or on a mattress and get out and nobody puts a break on your language or on your rage. And then you can go out and you can be civil again. A way of directing your own... Yes. shed tears not yes. towards the patient. Yes, but you have a not on your husband or wives or children, you know, which mm -hmm. is very often the case. We all need a safe place where we can externalize it. But I think there needs to be more training how to do it in a safe place. Mm -hmm. Because we've had many beautiful physicians who, when I push their buttons, and I love to do that, mm -hmm. they get into a psychotic homicidal rage and get in touch with some very painful old business. And then if you're not afraid and really are good at it and safe for your colleague who's doing that, they come out of it and they will never again hurt the fly. I can give you an example if you want. I'd like my one. Own. I was supposed to give a workshop in Hawaii, the same kind of workshop. And I promised the Hawaiians I would come, but we just couldn't find an accommodation for 75 people with all the requirements we have, that you have to be able to scream and no police comes and stuff like that. And I almost gave up when a woman called up and said, Elizabeth, I have just the perfect place for this, only one hook to it. I unfortunately don't listen to details. So I said, take it. The hook was, they can only give it to me 
next year in the spring a certain week. And I said, take it. Didn't have a calendar, didn't bother looking. This is like small print. When you have a publisher, always read the small print. Otherwise, it ruins your whole life. Uh, I didn't check it, unfortunately, and a year later, and I sent them a thousand dollar deposit, and all the formalities were taken care of. And then a year later, when I finally looked at the calendar, I said, oh my God, they gave me Easter week. And I really reacted ugly. I had an angry reaction. That's my reaction from the emotional quadrant. Anytime you react instead of act, it's unfinished business. If it's longer than 15 seconds. I was a sour, I was angry. My intellectual quadrant comes to my rescue to justify my ugliness and said, oh, Elizabeth, you're entitled to be angry. You're giving so much of your time. You're gone all the time. You have two small children. And Easter and Christmas, at least you should be home. The moment I said that, so I said, no, that can't be the reason. I know why I'm angry. You don't get any Catholics. No Catholics come during Easter week. You also don't get any Jews, because it's the same holiday season. And to have a workshop with all good Protestants, I couldn't stand that. Because the beauty about my workshops is you get poor and rich, doctors and cleaning women, um, you know, religious and non-religious, and after two days of not knowing who you are, you only call each other by the first name, you don't care anymore who you are because you are like me. It's a very beautiful experience. So I also knew that this can't be. So I gave up. I went to Hawaii as Sawapus, Grouchy, and I went to see the place they gave me. It was a residential school for girls. And the moment I was assigned to my room, I had a temper tantrum. It was a room of a teenager who obviously was not told that their rooms are rented out. And they were sent home over Easter so the guy can make $8,000. And I knew it because teenagers don't leave certain private stuff on their desks. Do you understand? Because I never had private space in my life. Everything was shared. I'm now the intruder into somebody's very private, sacred space. I very ugly reacted. And then this man made a mistake to invite himself to my workshop. And I was so angry at him, I couldn't say no. Then he made the mistake to also invite his wife. By then I could have strangled him, even less to able to say no. Then at dinner he said the group eats too much. And I was just ready to, I can't tell you what, the, the workshop hadn't even started. Then I, um, asked for papers and crayolas for the drawings, and they said 10 cents for a sheet of paper, 69 cents for the use of a box of crayola, 25 cents for each cup of coffee because the coffee prices went up. All I can tell you is by Wednesday I was ready to put him in a meat slicer. By Thursday I think I wanted to put iodine on each slice. By Friday it was a meat grinder or something. I could have killed this man. I drained all my beautiful energy not to look at him to keep my group going. And I go around preaching unconditional love. And there's somebody in the group that I could kill, literally, not figuratively speaking. I believe you. I used all my energy not to look at him to keep the thing going and survive that week. Well, by Friday, I have never been more grateful when the workshop was over. Uh, people who jumped in Elia must make two commitments to work with me. One is that you do all your work with patients free of charge, that no bills ever. The other one is that when you get in touch with any unfinished business, you have to work on it because you can't go preaching and not practicing. So I knew when I get to my friends, the first thing they say, so all the way from Honolulu to California, to be home at least on Easter Sunday with my children in Chicago. I think, what did I get in touch with? And all I could come up with an intellectual diagnosis, I got in touch with an absolutely horrendous allergy to its cheap man. And the reason cheap man is because what aggravated me was the five cents, 10 cents, 25 cents, 69 cents. If he had honestly asked me, for $2,000 more because he underestimated mm -hmm. the cost, I would have written him a check, he would have never bothered me. 
So I didn't know what that meant. I tried to push it aside, couldn't. So my friends greet me in California on my stopover, and they said, how was your workshop? I said, fine, with this kind of expression. How was your workshop? Fine. And the third time I used a very unladylike language. And then they said, would you like to tell me about it? And I said, no. Wouldn't you rather tell me about it? I said, damn it, no. And they had only one mm. more chance. See, we can only, if you ask three more times. three times, you impose your will. So the last time they did the absolutely worst thing any human being can do to you when you're ugly, and that is to be sweet with you. They put their hand on my head in the sweetest way. They said, tell me all about Easter bunnies. And I totally exploded. My lid just came off. And I was furious, and I said, don't you talk to me like this. I'm a physician. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm 50 plus years old. Um, I don't believe in Easter bunnies anymore. Uh, if you want to talk like this to your clients, go ahead, be my guest, but not with me. And furious and insulted. But while I made this big defense speech, I started to sob, and I cried for eight hours. And I emptied the pool of repressed pain and anguish that I repressed for 45 years. Never came up in medical school, residence of psychiatry, psychoanalysis. Nobody ever touched upon it. And I let go of 45 years of repressed, unfinished business. What I got in touch with is that my one sister was forever on my mother's lap. My other sister was forever on my father's lap, and there was no third lap left. And I waited and waited, and it was never my turn. And after a while, I rejected them and their love. And I would never be picked up, and I don't want your love. Uh, because my fantasy was if they would love me, they would know me, and they would alternate. But my mother never knew that she always had the same child. And after I rejected them, I think my sole love object were my bunnies. And I cried on their fur, and I told them my grief, and they were my love objects. And I'm absolutely sure that human beings could be raised with loving animals. My only problem was that my father was a thrifty man, and every six months he wanted a rabbit roast. And I was ordered to pick one of my love objects, bring it to the butcher, wait outside for a paper bag with a warm meat in it of my beloved bunny, and then walk half an hour up the hill, deliver it to my mother's kitchen, and I was forced to eat at the dining room table and watch my family eat my love object. It was like cannibals to me. But I'd be darned to cry or to shed a tear or to share my pain with them, to punish them because they, quote, they didn't love mm. me. That's a four-year-old's arrogance and punishment of the parents for the sense of deprivation. And this went on for years, every six months or so, until I was six and a half years old. And I only had Blackie left, and Blackie was my most beloved. And in that regressed state, I relived the day when Blackie was ordered to be brought to the butcher by my father. And I became that six and a half year old girl, and I bent down in the grass, and I begged Blackie on my knees to run away. And Blackie loved me so much, he didn't budge, and I had to bring him to the butcher. Then the butcher came out with a bloody apron, and he was a huge guy with red hair and fri fri sideburns, fri fri freckles, freckles. <laughs> and in a very loud, boisterous voice, he gave me this paper bag and said, damn shame he had to bring this rabbit in a day or two, she would have had little bunnies. And I didn't even know it was a she bunny. And I was totally devastated. I remember I became like a zombie. I walked home with that paper bag. And I delivered it to my mother's kitchen. I dev never shed a tear. I understand now as a psychiatrist that every time after that, when I saw a thrifty man, and you see plenty of them, I repressed my pain, my anguish, my, the sense of unfairness more and more and more. And then after 50 years, one day, one man looks at you funny, and you kill him. Do you understand it? I'm not exaggerating, I mean that literally. If this man on Friday would have asked me for one more nickel, I would have been capable of killing him. I had so much anguish, uh, rage, unfairness bottled up for 45 years. 
And every human being in prison has a black bunny. That's the only reason why people kill, why people rape, why people are in prison. And we're doing that now with first offenders. I was in Maui and I shared with a group of prisoners that I'm working with. Uh, they are kept in jail up to 18 months without being con convicted. It's like a holding mm -hmm. correctional institution. I find it very cruel system to hold young men a year, 18 months without being sentenced and not knowing because their whole life is ruined by them. And I've, I'm working there with 20 young, young middle-aged men. And I went to visit them for the first time and they said, aren't you afraid to be here with 20 criminals in a room? And I looked at them, they could have been my sons. I said, criminals, if you're a criminal, I'm a criminal too. They're all criminals under certain circumstances. And I told him the black bunny story, and one young man jumped up. I thought he had a convulsion, but you're not allowed to touch them. So I just made like this, and he said, no, I just know now why I'm here. And he told the story. It was a young man who barely had a beard, a very young guy. He said when he was 14, he came home from school and had the urge to go into the living room, like a sense that there something was not right at home. And he saw his father sitting on the couch, gray. And he sat on the couch and took his father in his arms. And they loved each other very much. And his father died in his arms, 14-year-old son. And he said he just sat there and waited and waited. And it was a very sacred moment for him. And then after a while, the paternal grandmother walked in and got into a rage and accused him of killing his beloved father. And he said he didn't answer back because he didn't want to ruin this special moment. And he repressed it. And three days later at the funeral, the grandmother exploded again. And in front, and she had always been jealous, terribly envious. And uh, in front of all the funeral guests, the grandmother said that her son only died because of this grandchild. And he was ready to kill her, but he kept the lid on again to not ruin father's funeral. And two and a half years later, he was found outside of a supermarket, putting a shotgun on an old crouch who reminded him of this grandmother. And he put, the, uh, what do you call that, a shotgun, a cut-off mm -hmm. so shotgun, something on, on the temple, and just held it, very threatening, naturally. And then after a few minutes, he looks at this old face and says, oh my God, what am I doing? I don't want to hurt you. And apologized and dropped the gun and went home. And it's a small community, they found him. And he's now sitting in jail, awaiting 10 to 20 years sentence. And he said, that's, now I can understand why I do that. Do you understand how beautiful it would be if every first offender would have a chance to find out why and get cured of the cause of it instead of locking them up and then they go out and rape and kill again. My big dream is that physicians work in preventive psychiatry and preventive medicine and preventive criminology. And my ultimate dream, and I hope I can live that long, is to give every first grader a drawing to make to see what unfinished business they have. And then once more in third grade and once more in high school. And you could use a psychiatrist only for organic psychosis and organic illnesses. It would, would take so little time and so little money and you could do so much preventive mm. medicine. You have mentioned ways that physicians on wards can get rid of their unfinished business. What are some of the ways that staff can help each other while they're on the wards cope with the stresses and the We started problems. very simple, changing a clothes closet into a screaming room. We made it soundproof ourselves. The first person who came was the ward clerk. Ward clerks are always forgotten. They sit in a hallway and everybody unloads on them and they always have to be smiling because they're always in public. 
And they went in there and, boy, did they use the language and get certain people off their chest. Then they can go out again and smile. Then the externs came, then the interns, and after a long time, the residents, and very few of the faculty. But the hospital chaplains came, the nurses came, the nurses, nursing students, and whenever they need to explode, instead of letting it out on somebody, they go in there and let it out. Then you can have a civil dialogue and not overreact. I mean, you still have to tell people if they're unfair. You still have to tell people if they avoid the patient. But you don't do it in an accusing, judgmental, critical, negative way. Mm -hmm. You do it in a loving, understanding, compassionate way. And help them say, look, it, I've gone through that. I know what it's like. Go in there and let off your overload, mm -hmm. which stems back from childhood, has like nothing to do with that patient. The patient only pushes your button. Mm -hmm. So you should bless them and not curse mm -hmm. them. You mentioned Shanti Nilaya 10 minutes ago, the word Shanti Nilaya. It's Can a you place, talk about that? It's a place where we not only answer hundreds and thousands of letters of desperate people, mainly parents of children who have been murdered, get no help anywhere until now. Uh, it's a national organization now for parents of murdered children. Uh, parents of children who commit suicide have a lot of grief, work, guilt, and shame. And they're ostracized very often, especially I'm thinking of one mother who had three children, all of them committed suicide within three years, not related supposedly to each other. Those people need help to keep their sanity and to live after they recuperate. So Shantilaya is a center where people can reach, where people can get help, uh, where people can call up, and where we also hope to train more people to staff screaming rooms to give the workshops we give to help people get rid of their unfinished business. And our ultimate dream, naturally, is that somebody who has money donates us a piece of land so mm. we can start the children's center and the university. You mentioned money. You mentioned earlier that you don't charge patients any money. Can you <laughs> talk problem. about that and uh, that what, what philosophically that means to you and where? I found that people who have gifts of any kind, whether they're psychic gifts or healing gifts or gifts in anything, do well for a while and then it goes to their head or to their purse. And once they misuse their gifts, they lose it. And I want to be sure that people who work for something like do it out of love and not for any secondary gains. And the only way I know how to do that is that you do with only what you need, not what you want. And when I did all the courses in, in, with the medical students, I always told them you don't need grants. All you need is love. It doesn't cost anything to help somebody, which is true to a certain point, but it's not really true now. We spend about $40,000 a month just answering mail. To maintain mail. your... Yes. It's just the rent of the place, insurance, mail, and telephones. Rent of the places to give workshops. No, we can't even give workshops there. It's just no. offices for secretaries to no. answer the mail. And, and the telephone. Where do you get the 40000 from? Well, I have to lecture until it comes out of my ears. I sell my books, I sell tapes, and out of books, all my income is books, tapes, lectures, and we make a little bit of workshops, not too much. But your patient care is it's free. It's free, yeah. But we hope that one day we'll have a piece of land and the children's center, and then we can train more people to send them to the prisons, to send them to schools to do preventive psychiatry. And naturally, medical schools mm -hmm. helping physicians to become full human yeah. beings before they are sent out into private practice. That would be nice. It's so simple because it takes really terribly little time and, and very little money considering what we spend on, on other institutional mm -hmm. care. I wanted to ask you some questions about special types of patients and questions which medical students and health professionals have about them. The unconscious patient, 
the comatose patient. Uh, medical students are often insecure about what types of communication they can have with these, these patients. W what's your experience with that? They can hear everything. Always presume that they can hear every word. We have had more reports from patients who came out of surgery into a recovery room who were supposedly still out, and they repeat dialogues between physicians and nurses that would make your hair stand up. We have many patients who get a tiny bit too much anesthetic or react more than average people who have an out-of-body experience during surgery, which is very frequent and they hear they're aware of absolutely everything that's going on even during surgery uh, so if you work on a patient or, or in a room of a comatose patient or if a family is with a dying patient who has slipped into a coma is really the best time to talk to them because they're aware of everything although you will not be able to get the verbal answer back mm -hmm. it's also time to still say i'm sorry or I love you or whatever mm. you have not had the courage to say. Right. Suicidal patients uh, are terminally ill patients. Uh, are many of them suicidal or is this not? In well, 20 what's... years we had one suicide. In 20 years one that's far beyond, below the average population. Dying patients appreciate life far more than you and I. If the quality of life is such that you can call it living and not existing. Um, if I was in an intensive care unit hooked up on machines and somebody would limit my visitors to five or ten minutes every hour and I would not be allowed to have, see my children, I would become very angry and very suicidal. I would sign out AMA instantly I find this cruel and inhuman. And I think somebody in a committee should reevaluate what kind of patients you keep in intensive care units. Intensive care units should be active treatment units. You would sign out AMA against medical advice? You bet. I would get out of there faster than you would ever think I could move. I would have some old friends carry me out through the window. Uh -huh. uh, not to allow children to visit dying parents to me is very cruel i think my heartache would not be that i have to die but yeah. that my last week or two weeks i can't see my children share every moment of my remaining life with them or my grandchildren for that matter to a su to a suicidal patient uh, what's your gut level response to a patient who asks for a mercy killing a terminal patient yes who is asking to be killed. Mm -hmm. I would ask them why, what, what is unbearable. It is most of the time pain, or playing games, or nobody talks to them anymore, or they have been very, very controlling executives who have all their life been in character, and if they cannot control everything, life is not worth living. And I would give them controls that are bearable for physicians, nurses, and family. If I would have to do a procedure on them, I would say, Mr. So-and-so, we have this and this procedure. Would you like to have it at 10 o'clock or at 3 o'clock? And I would naturally ask the nurses first, what two times are the most convenient for you? And he would make like an executive decision. And after a long thing, he would say 3 o'clock. If the wife comes and every time he gave her a hard time, I said, call him up first and ask him, when you should visit, with whom you should visit, how long you should stay. And they will then do this like they have given executive orders in their corporation. Mm -hmm. And you have agreeable nurses, you have agreeable patients, accept their personality and their weaknesses and turn it into a blessing. So your approach to a suicidal patient isn't to say, well, yes, you have the right to end your life, but to say, what is the problem and help let me help you I'll with your give need. You a very practical example a few weeks ago somebody called me and literally asked for my okay to commit suicide and they said how can you do that over the telephone you know i don't know you i don't know why is life so miserable well you wouldn't like to live this way either i said what is this way what does that mean 
She says, well, I'm on dialysis every other day. I said, that's pretty miserable. She said, and then it takes me a day to recuperate. I said, that's pretty miserable. She said, I'm also blind. I also have my legs amputated. My left hand is also amputated. My right hand has a few fingers left, and they want to amputate it next week. So this is my last chance that I can actually do something, because I'm blind on dialysis, no legs, no arms. I have only these stumps left, and I want to do that before they come and amputate it. Would you like to live this way? Now is it okay to commit suicide? What would you say to such a man? What's your gut reaction? Say he even sits in front of you. Mm -hmm. I guess my gut level reaction would be to see if there's anything worth living for. Well, what, could, there? You, what could you imagine with no legs, no arms, blind, and every other day on dialysis? I can't. It's, it's impossible to, to conceive right offhand. So I said, this is a terribly uh, a difficult situation. Uh, where do you live? I asked him where he was, and I looked on my map where I am. And I said, if you hang in there two weeks, I'll be in that, in that town, and we can talk about all the possible alternatives. He says, I don't want an alternative. I said, you are thinking about other things, otherwise you wouldn't call up. You would have done it. But there must be a part of you who wants to look at other alternatives. But two weeks later, I saw him, and I asked him, but the difference was whether he can just not have another amputation, which I wouldn't like. Why is he still going to the dialysis? He would die a natural death without active suicide. And then it came out that he was always in control of his life. He built race cars, he was a daredevil, and he'll be damned if he dies a slow, passive death. He has to commit the act of suicide. And I said, God, what an unused gift. You must have been a rebel and never learned positive submission, which is one of the things we have to learn in life. I said, could you move through that rebellion and look at your horrible predicament and teach little children who have diabetes what not to do so not to <laughs> you who was so defiant that you didn't stick to your medication, to your diet. And now you pay the price for the consequences of your own rebellion. Yeah. A group of diabetic children, would you come and do that for them? They said, I don't know about it. I said, you're in control how long to talk, how long to do this and that. He came all the way to the curtain when we had the meeting, and he rolled his wheelchair out. He's still alive. He's still thinking about whether to give up his negative rebellion. And finally, before he dies, live on positive submission. But he has something to work on. It's not yes or no. I, I uh, think in every life there is something you can learn and grow. And this man has a lot to learn. Geriatric patients, patients whose, whose death is not imminent yet, they make statements about it is their time to die. How does that hit you? What's your it reaction? It is time to die of the question. A geriatric patient whose death isn't imminent, but who will make the statement to you that it is now my time to die. I would listen to them. I've had many patients that I said, I'll visit you at Christmas, and they said no. And they died before Christmas. If they are not in a clinical depression, you know, there are people who have mm -hmm. bellyache, it's cancer, uh, and they're dying all their life long. They, have, they are really psychiatric patients. But healthy old people, healthy in this sense, they, if they are intuitive, if they are whole, they will be so intuitive, they can tell you that they're not here at Christmas and they will die. Look at the old Eskimos how accurately they knew. They lived in harmony with life, with nature. And they knew when time came, they invited all their relatives to a big feast. They had a big meal together, and then they stepped out into the ice. That was not suicide. They died of natural causes. 
Well, what are the implications of, of your work for the care of the aged? Just love them and accept them, and when they say, my time comes very close, don't pat them on the back and say, oh, no, you're going to live to 100. That means you cannot accept that grandma has to die soon. Listen, sit at their feet and listen to them. They teach you all about life and living, and especially the grouchy, miserable ones. Mm -hmm. They're marvelous teachers. I hope that our nursing homes are going to be changed totally and completely. Uh, nursing homes are geared towards institutional care, to isolate them, shut them out, don't burden me with incontinent grouchy grandma or grandpa. And you exist in a nursing home, you don't live. Nobody can live without being needed or wanted or loved and touched and hugged. And my big dream, and I hope that we are able to put this into practice soon, is to bring toddlers of working parents into the nursing homes during the daytime. And the grandmas and grandpas can come downstairs and spoil them and love them and touch them and rock them and hug them. And in exchange, they get touched and loved and hugged and nurtured. And this would be a mutual benefit. And little children would love wrinkled faces again. Do you know that we spent $6 billion on erasing wrinkles in the United States of America? I didn't know that. On cosmetics? I would like half of it. <laughs> Change all the nursing homes. Sounds good. And the parents would worry less about where to put their children during their hours when they were old uh, senile and uh, difficult old people uh, who, whose intellectual quadrant doesn't work anymore. You can keep them from becoming senile if you give them pets or children and if they're touched and if they're stimulated. Not artificially, but mm -hmm. like in lifestyle. Can you mention possibilities for the care of, say, an elderly patient who has no family and maybe is bounced around from one city hospital to another? Well, that's where my dream nursing home toddler care center comes in, where they would do as many things on their own, but also participate in the toddler program. They could teach little boys wood carving, or grandmas can teach them knitting or embroidery mm -hmm. or whatever they can still do, making eyes of God and stuff right. like that be creative together and, and adventure out together. Um, once they are senile, uh, they just need, like what children need in the first year of life, a lot of touch and love and care and nurturing. And they are most of the time again out of their body and then they hear what you say. And they are aware of the foul language that we sometimes use about those people. Mm -hmm. So people who work in nursing homes, have to be terribly careful what language they use. For people who are chronically ill and terminally ill, you've mentioned the possibility of them dying at home. Um, can you talk about what it's like to have people at home in their last weeks rather than in the hospital? What's been your experience it's with this? It's tough and very, very beautiful. I would say 99% of all my patients die at home. Uh, the only people that prevent us from doing it are physicians who feel their duty is to prolong life at all costs and do not allow a wife to take a husband home or make them feel very guilty. And that is their own unfinished business. That's why you need to help physicians get in touch with their unfinished business. I see the family first. I ask them what their accommodations are, if it is feasible for practical purposes. It's not always feasible, you understand. If you have a grandma who has a rectal cancer and they live in a small apartment with six children and grandchildren, you can't take such patients home. I had a six-year-old boy who was in the hospital dozens of times because he was half beaten to death by his father. And when he died of leukemia, we could not take him home because the father would have killed him. So for those children, you need a hospice, a children's hospice. How about for two, patients? For grown-ups. Too. You need a special place to take them, but normally, no, 99% of the people can be taken care of at home, and the hospice team can make home care. And I make house calls and 
the clergy visits people at home and you take care of all their needs at home. How about for a patient who wants to stay in the hospital because the hospital to them represents the last hope, although they would have perhaps a more caring environment at home. How do you approach a patient in that situation when you've presented the possibilities and the patient is unsure and... You lovingly give him all the options and tell him what the advantages are and the disadvantages and look at the messages between the line. The symbolic language, maybe a wife gives him a very disguised message that you're too much for me, it would kill me. And the husband does it not for him, but for her. So you have to be very careful. You can't just listen at the verbal communication. Many times we've had patients said, we stay here. Then when you listen to the communication of the wife, you understand that she already put the guilt trip on him, that it would kill her, she couldn't manage. And then you see volunteers, you need a huge army of volunteers in hospices. Volunteers do most of your work. And if they love it and are good at it, you do not need all professional help. Pain is a problem and is something that you've probably had a lot of experience with Used physical and psychological. It's a problem for medical students because they read articles and journals about how pain is very difficult to control. Yet there are reports from hosp hospices like St. Christopher's that apparently have great success in you controlling can't do pain. What they do. What's, See, uh, what's, what's... St. <coughs> Christopher is in England, and in England <coughs> they give generously heroin. So stick to your own country. Mm -hmm. you, you have different rules and regulations and laws. Can you uh, keep a patient somewhat pain-free and can alert? Keep them, you can keep them almost exclusively pain-free and conscious and alert. We used to use the American version of Prompton Mixture, which is written up in many places, from the Canadian Medical Journal to uh, papers by Dr. Lamov from Marine County Hospice. Uh, the Brompton mixture is no longer in use in uh, avant-garde hospices in the last year, simply because cocaine has become very rare and scarce. The dentists use it. The import is not increasing with the number of hospices coming up. And I presume that you understand the problems we have with hospices in this country. They're coming up like chicken delights. We had over 100 hospices coming up in one state in one year. And so the cocaine uh, is no longer available. And that tragedy led to a big blessing, and that is that inventive pharmacists together with physicians have come up with new formulas of pain relief. And one of them is that they give every regular three, four hours, they give an oral uh, morphine, elixir by mouth and you do not give injections so that you can give it to them by mouth and take them home and do not need a dopey patient who is okay for an hour and then it weans off and then he starts ringing the nurse when do I get my next injection? Mm -hmm. If you take care of lovingly of dying patients physically comfortable and alert and help the family cope with whatever unfinished business guilt, shame, fears, anxieties they have, and have enough volunteers so not one person takes care 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Nobody can do that. It is a blessing to be able to die mm -hmm. at home, surrounded by your loved ones, with your pet on your feet mm -hmm. and the children around with the smell of a good vegetable soup or a cup of coffee. I have one final question. I was reading Derek Gill's biography of you, and it mentioned that you've received over 20 honorary degrees. You travel a quarter million miles a year. You receive 3,000 letters a month. And among all this attention that's focused on you, what helps you remain humble enough to say what he quotes you as saying? They often put me on a pedestal. They treat me as some sort of demigod. Yet all I want of people, of someone, is for them to say, come on in and have a cup of tea or kick off your shoes. What? allows you to say that in the midst of all this other thing, other stuff? The only thing that keeps you alive, literally, is the moments you have with real friends who love you for what you are. 
and with real patients who dropped being phony baloney. And then a few alone moments when I can be in my garden and be by myself. You need that very badly, otherwise you could not survive. And the, the total faith and knowledge that you always get what you need, not what you want. Thanks for being here, Elizabeth. Thank you.